you get to, right? And he thinks you're paying something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cash bar, and I sit down and do it. Good. You make a good lot today? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm ready to get well. Uh, yeah, Stan and I are comparing notes as to what we shouldn't say. <laughs> Stan's got some stories, Danny, that he's not telling, and you're going to owe him a lot of money after this. Yeah. So, uh, when the
good news. These people out of the audience are here to thank you for 11 really great years as football coach at Clemson and to wish you the very best of luck in the future. They've given us a lot of fond memories, and they just want to tell you how much they appreciate it. That's the good news. Bad news. How much is it going to cost? <laughs> Bad news is the people up on the podium are here to roast you tonight. <laughs> We got Rodney Williams, the quarterback you said couldn't throw straight. <laughs> the past Penn State silly. We got uh, Buddy King. And, uh, but Buddy King, Buddy's here somewhere. All right, Buddy King's coming, who said he taught you everything you need to know about football. <laughs> Phil Clark, who gave you every, told you how to recruit. Coach Coward, who told you how to coach. <laughs> Jane Robolo, who gave you every good line you ever needed. <laughs> and Stan Lennock, who taped you over and over and over until <laughs> so you got it right. <laughs> so we're going to have dinner first, and then we're going to turn over these nice folks. How long do you think we'll be here? <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> I saw Coach Howard's list. <laughs> what he had to say about you. And you may be here a while. <laughs> you may be here a while. Now, folks. Danny was coming to Greenville tonight for a business meeting. I told him some businessmen in Chicago were flying down to meet him about establishing a, a mini restaurant brewery in Greenville. <laughs> and they were going to give him the distribution the rights. The brewery got me. I <laughs> they were going to give him the distribution rights to the, uh, to the beer. And they're also giving him appearance money for the restaurant. I, I kind of lied to him a little bit. <laughs> if someone will bring him a beer and I'll pay for it. No, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and here's your dollar. I've got to watch my image. And here's, <laughs> and here's your appearance money. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no kids here, all right? We have everybody here. Don't worry, we have everybody here. Okay. Um, Let's have, uh, I think we have, why well, we have Kermit Watson come up and return thanks and we'll at least start the evening out on a positive note. Missy Thompson, then we have Stan Olenek, and Stan's a lovely wife, Mary Olenek. We have Jane Robolo, uh, we have Rodney Williams with us tonight, and the girl. Joni Walters. You've been seeing her a long time, haven't you? <laughs> He's not as dumb as he looks. <laughs> I guess, no, 
Jody, you've been seeing him a long time, haven't you? <laughs> oh, said that one. Okay. Here we have Danny Ford. Uh, here we have Danny's lovely wife, Deborah. We have Phil Clark. Uh, Phil's wife, uh, Lynn Clark. And then we have the legend himself uh, came over to grace us, grace us with his presence. Now that our guest is here. <laughs> it's over. Was there anything you wanted to say before everybody starts on you? No, Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Get that watch. <laughs> uh, our first, first roaster tonight uh, the pretty, is the pretty face on the program that we have tonight. The pretty face we have on the program tonight. Stand up, Coach. Hey. <laughs> You forgot your cues, Joe. Get, get up. The other pretty face we have on the program tonight, we have Jane Robolo, who is the anchor on WSPA. She is Clemson's Young Alumni of the Year, and she also served as chair of the Central Spirit Committee the year Clemson won the national championship. Jane. Nice to get first. Maybe Danny will forget everything I said by the time the rest of them get through with it. I don't get nervous when I'm talking. <laughs> Better watch out. I know where you were Wednesday night. They're going to tell that one later. I'm the one who said, yes, you had better call your wife. I <laughs> moving to divorce court. <laughs> no, I, I really, it's uh, it's a, quite an honor to get up here and not have to say nice things about them like I do at the spring banquet, you know. I had to, for a couple of years in Spartanburg, say nice things about Danny and it was a real short introduction, so I got about four hours, I'm gonna roll on here. <laughs> this is a real nice thing. Before we, let's give Glenn Bracken a hand. Oh, yeah. freshmen together at Clemson. I'm sure he doesn't remember that. But my freshman year was the same year that Danny Ford was made head football coach at Clemson. So we sort of started together. And I would think that probably the biggest year at Clemson that he had was also the biggest year at Clemson that I had because on January 1st of 1992, Clemson University won the National Football Championship. And an even bigger, more incredible feat than that, in August of 1982, I graduated. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I found a picture from 1982 the other day, or actually it was from 81, and it was a pep rally that we're doing. It was a Danny Ford Appreciation Day pep rally. You might remember that one, Deborah, because we had Deborah um, judge. We had all these kids come up, and they were being Danny Ford lookalikes. And, all of them were ugly, so it was real hard for Deborah to pick them around. <laughs> and I found a picture that they had taken of me and Danny. I was presenting them with some sort of a plaque from the students, and I had this long hair, and Danny had hair. And it was real <laughs> You could tell that was an old shot. <laughs> Probably one of Danny's greatest claims to fame back in those years is that he was the only man who could strike fear in the heart of William Perry. <laughs> and then when, when, when William first got there, you know, he tried to do it like you got all the other boys, you know, he'd grab him by the shirt and he'd shake him and he'd say, you know, you this, that, and the other, and I'm gonna, didn't matter, didn't shake William at all, he wasn't a bit nervous. So Danny thought, God, what can my next tactic be? So then he started kind of threatening him, look, William, if you don't do what I tell you to, you're not gonna be able to go out on Saturday night after the football game, didn't matter. Finally it occurred to him, he looked at William, he took a look at William's waist size and he said, William, if you don't cooperate, buddy, your meal ticket's gone. And from then on, <laughs> it was like handling a baby. After I graduated, thanks to Stan Olenek, I had the honor of working with Danny on the coaches show, which was just loads of fun, especially to see Danny just a little bit nervous about something because when Stan took over the coaches show, he changed the format. And we had a good time. We'd go out to different places, you know, and, and do the show. And so the first year, Danny was a little nervous about it because he wasn't quite sure what to expect. 
But by the third year, he was saying, Hey, Stan, did you wipe balance the camera yet? Hey, Stan, we didn't give him a three count. Hey, man, it's like, golly, you know, talk about creating a monster. Do you know anything about TV, bro? <laughs> and some of our better times out, one time we decided, you know, we need to go to places with this show where people can really appreciate what Clemson's all about. Especially since ESPN's going to be picking up some of these shows. So Stan says, you know, Max Drive-In is Clemson. You know, that's Clemson sports. That's where it's Esther feeds these boys day in and day out, and they just drive with away from work for Esther. So he said, why don't we do the show for Max? Stand up, Esther. Everybody's got to see us. always impressed with good anatomy. So as we're getting ready to roll the show together, Stan says, now Danny, you know, we need to get this thing done. We want you to cooperate. I'm fine. I'll cooperate. I'm fine. He looks over there and he sees Esther. And he says, hey Esther, come over here. And Esther, loving Danny, obliged him. She walked over there and right in front of God and everybody puts his arm around Esther and says, look at that, ain't them the biggest you ever seen? <laughs> Fortunately for Danny, she did not have her spatula in her hand. But I've learned an awful lot about anatomy from Danny. That was, you know, he's always impressed with anatomy. One time I asked him, I don't know why, I know him well enough, why should I ask him these kind of things? I said, Danny, what is that little pouch hanging down from your rear view mirror on your truck? <laughs> and he explained it quite literally what it was. What it was was what is left when a bull is not a bull anymore. <laughs> You know, we'll go out to the farm and we'll do the show from there. And so that was a lot of fun. Kern was all excited about it. And then we waited, Stan said, let's make sure we do it before the North Carolina game. Because you know how they are with their little khaki pants and their little starched white shirts and everything. We'll go out to the farm. You know, we are pickup trucks and what kind of beer do you sell? Budweiser. And Budweiser beer. I wanted to make sure. Long neck Budweiser beer. Don't make any mistake about it. You know, so let's go out to the farm, and that's a perfect show we'll do for the North Carolina show. Well, it had been a while since I had been around large cows. And I just sort of thought they were all the same. And there was this one exceptionally large cow who had a very mean look in its eye. And I said, golly, Danny, that's about the biggest cow I've ever seen. I said, what kind of cow is that? Jane, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 26. Darling, if you're 26 years old and you finish Clemson University and you don't know that thing over there is a bull, you better start all over again. Honey. <laughs> but there was one, one time when he, when anatomy was like the last thing that he wanted to worry about. We were out at the lake house doing one of the shows. And he said, all the guys were set out in the back and the, and the guys had the camera set up and everything. And Stan and Danny were doing their part of the show and Danny said, Jane, why don't you take the key and go look inside? He said, Deborah's done a great job decorating the house. It's real pretty in there. Why don't you go look around inside? So I was inside po poking around, looking at the wallpaper and everything, real pretty house. And all of a sudden, there's just uproarious laughter comes from the back. And they're laughing so hard, they're crying. And I said, what's going on? They go walking out there, and Danny's pulling his pants on. <laughs> I don't know why they were laughing so hard. Well. <laughs> then a couple minutes later, he starts fidgeting around again and jumping up and down and everything. And, Jane, turn your head. I said, why? Just turn your head. So I turned my head and he dropped his drawers again. There was a bee down in his pants. <laughs> well, what Danny didn't know was that our camera guys kept rolling on the table. <laughs> When we got back to the ranch, I took a look at it, and I realized that Danny didn't want me, he didn't want me to turn my head because he was embarrassed that I might see some private part. He was embarrassed because he was wearing brown boxer shorts. <laughs> I know Trevor didn't pick those out. <laughs> but speaking of Danny's assets, 
<laughs> the nicest one that he has is that wife right there, right off the cover of Vogue magazine. And the proof came, see he's not entirely dumb either. The proof came though, true story, and my, where's Bob Jubeck? Come on, bears. Did he go already? It was shortly after Danny had resigned, like a couple of days later, and everybody was looking for him, you know, all the media was after him. And Deborah was backing out of the driveway at the house. And Bob Jubeck and Fred Cunningham had just been there and they were knocking on the front door. And I guess Deborah didn't hear him because she was already leaving out the back. So Deborah's backing out, true story, Deborah's backing down the driveway and they saw the car. And so they went running up to the car. Then they kind of tapped on the window and Deborah stopped the car. They went running around the car and in all honesty, Bob went running up to Deborah and said, excuse me, he said, we're looking for your dad. Is he anywhere around? <laughs> Thank you very much. Dad's not here right now. He should be back in a little true story right there. Yeah, 40 that day. What a good birthday present to get for your 40th birthday. Well, those are the fun stories. Um, I don't want to be sentimental, but I'm the only girl who's talking, so I guess I'm. They've been great times. There are times that each and every one of us could write down an essay in what Danny Ford means to me, but. Um, He's a good boy most of the time. When he calls his wife at 4 o'clock in the morning, she might disagree with that, but I'll let somebody else say that. <laughs> but you're a good boy. We keep on loving you. We've been loving you for a long time. We won't stop anytime soon. God bless you. Jane. Uh, Jane I, I know Jane has the late news tonight, so at some point in time she's going to have to run. Uh, so I want to go ahead and thank you for coming over tonight. Thank you ever so much for doing that. Uh, how you doing? Oh, you're making notes now. Okay. <laughs> uh, next we have uh, Buddy King. Uh, coach King lives in Columbia now. He was Danny's uh, line coach. I uh, coached with Danny from 1979 uh, through the 1983 football season. Uh, and since then, he has coached at uh, Wake Forest and uh, USC. So we want to bring uh, Coach King up here and give him a nice little welcome. Well, I, I sure appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to come back in front of good Clemson people. <laughs> I guess uh, the thing I had to do first when I when they first called and asked me about this thing, I said, "Well, heck, I'm gonna call a couple guys and see what see what I can dig up." Well, first I called Woody McCorvey, and then I called Chuck Reedy, and and both of them wanted me to be sure and thank Coach Ford and everyone publicly for all his kind remarks that. He made to him through the years on the sideline. <laughs> they they did say that that they uh, that they both were going to run the sweep a lot more this next year. <laughs> But uh, in, in, all, in all honesty, the, probably the two stories that I can say kind of publicly uh, <laughs> about, about Coach Ford is, I, I can remember back in, this was 1980, and I know many of you can remember 1980 yeah. as, <laughs> as, not, as not one of our, our better years, but uh, we were kind of, we were doing pretty good. We were four and one, and then all of a sudden the bottom fell in, and we had, uh, I remember we had, we had Wake Forest like 35 to seven with 11 minutes left, and when they set the record for onside kicks and recovered like six of them in a row, and it was, uh, that, that was probably one of, one of our, our better things that, that we did that year. But somewhere there towards the end of the year, we had a recruiting meeting. You know, Coach Ford, he's all gung-ho on recruiting and, and everything. And we had this 
he wasn't in a real good mood that year anyway. So in, in this recruiting meeting, he said, we got to have some linebackers. We ain't got no linebackers. So they asked for volunteers. And this was about two or three weeks before we played Carolina and said, I need, a, I need somebody to go to Kansas. And he looked at me. And kind of everyone at the table looked at me and I said, well, I guess I'll go. <laughs> and he said, I said, well, when do I have to go? He said, well, I'll let you know in a week. I'll know something in a week. So, lo and behold, about we were getting ready to play South Carolina on Saturday. On Monday, he says, buddy, you've got to leave Saturday right after the game. And I said, what? I said, you got to leave Saturday right after the game. Well, here we are. We're five and five. And yeah, we're, I mean, if we don't beat South Carolina, they, they're going to throw us out to do everything and all this. And so, lo and behold, God, we played them. We beat the heck out of them. It was like 27 to three or something. And, it was the last year of George Rogers. He doesn't score or anything. And so here I am. I'm all fired up after the game. And I go on there and I got to go to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Not only go to Kansas, but I'm out there. And I'm out there. And I'm out there. <laughs> and I'm out there. And finally, I come back. So I end up having to go back again. Well, the next time I go back, and Coach Ford, he doesn't even offer to go to Kansas. He's going everywhere else in the country, but not to Kansas. <laughs> so finally, I'm out there the last time. Anyone ever been to Kansas? <laughs> Arkansas City, Kansas? You know, they only have tornadoes there about every day. Uh, Arkansas City, Kansas makes Westminster look like a big metropolitan <laughs> But it, it, um, it was great for the six weeks in a row that I spent there. <laughs> but I do want to thank you, Coach Ford. That was, that was a lot of fun, but we, we did end up getting the guy, so it turned out okay. But the other, I guess, I guess the other uh, stories that, that, that I've got about Danny are... are you know, I was sitting there all this time trying to think about things that 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 I could say about him and, and humor, and there's a lot of them, but the part I remember about Danny Ford the most is uh, I can remember when he first came to Clemson in 1977, and uh, I don't know, we just kind of, we got along good together, and it was a lot of fun. All those years, we both had uh, we both had good times, and we both had some had some down times. We we had some great memories there, and I'm looking forward to seeing Danny back in coaching real soon because I know he's going to be. And wish he and Deborah and everyone wish all you at Clemson a lot of luck. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Danny, we got two ACC football officials we're seeing here tonight. Uh, Gil Rush. We've got, we got Gil Rush and Rod Daly. They're both good ones, I guarantee you. Where's Rod? Where's Rod? Rod Daly. Rod Daly here? I know he's here somewhere. He's worried about that Florida State game. <laughs> The ACC office special guilt was to send to tell you goodbye and Rod was to make sure you're gone. <laughs> you, you doing all your hands there? No, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Let's go to uh, next I, person. I got a left body with Coach Howard. <laughs> <laughs> you got one you can't deny, but it's not Coach Howard. Uh, let's go to Phil Clark. Phil was a, uh, was a football coach at Greer High School for 27 years and he served as head coach for 20 years. Let's turn it over to Phil. Phil? Hey, these first two 
too sure have been nice. <laughs> Danny, before I begin, I just want to tell you one thing. Lynn and I are taking the children to the beach in the morning, and I'm running a little short of money. You got to have a couple hundred. I can have <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Danny has come a long way, hasn't he? <laughs> I remember his first game as head football coach at the Gator Bowl. I know many of you do. Lynn and I were down there, and the afternoon of the game, we were in the lobby of the hotel, and Danny and I went into the lounge. And we sat there for a while and had a couple of Cokes. <laughs> and suddenly Dan says, Damn, what time is it? And I said, It's 2 15. He said, Golly, I missed the bus. That the, we were taking the boys to the movies, and I'm supposed to be on the bus. Can you have your car here? I said, Yeah. Said, Can y'all take me downtown? So Lynn and I took him downtown to the movie. On the way down there, he just fidgeted. He said, Feels I'm so nervous, I don't know what to do. He says, Tell me what to do tonight. Lynn, isn't this true? <laughs> and I said, well, Daniel, when the whistle blows, you'll be all right. But let me tell you one thing. If it's a close game, which it probably will be, I'll give you one piece of advice. Late in the game, have Charlie Bowman. <laughs> Give that center a good forearm shiver, then drop back to his left and intercept that darn pass. <laughs> now, since that time, he has called me every year before a bowl game, and Sonny Rim and I are his, his bowl coaches. Sonny and I go down about a week before the game and tell Danny what to do. <laughs> now, during this time, I have missed two games. How many have you lost? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're going to be coaching next year somewhere, I feel sure. And when you're getting ready to go up O, just call Sonny and me, and we'll come on down there. But I tell you, you're going to have to pay us more than a dozen horses on the half shell and a couple of beers. <laughs> He's the tightest guy I ever saw. <laughs> Jane mentioned about doing a show out at the farm. Is she already gone? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> a couple of years ago, he started what he said was a hay barn. And Sonny and I were out there. He had about 20 old telephone poles, and he dug some holes, and we had to get those poles up and even them up and put the frames up, and then we'd go back about a week later, and Danny and Barney are up on the the roof there putting tin on. And uh, so Sonny helped, us, helped them put a little tin on the roof. And you know how determined Danny is. Well, he got that thing finished and he put hay in it for a while. But I, I don't know how I found this out, but he finally confided, I think, and told me, really, he planned to make an athletic boner out of it. <laughs> And went out farming. He was out there just with his cows, and so we talked. And he said, "I, you know, I, I have not told anybody this, but said uh, everybody's speculating on why I resigned, um, and I haven't told anybody. But we've been pretty close, and so I'm just going to tell you. And I don't want it spread around, but I resigned for health reasons. <laughs> so I just made Max Lennon sick." <laughs> guys I've ever known, but Danny just gave him hell, didn't he? <laughs> I tell you, 
Danny could never get on the PGA tour, could he? <laughs> well, I tell you, that's not discrimination I've never seen. <laughs> what people didn't know, though, Woody had rock music going on that head. <laughs> he wasn't paying a bit of attention to it. <laughs> One more thing, I'll sit down. And I hesitate about saying this because Lynn might never let me go to the coach's clinic again after this. But Danny and I were down to the coach's clinic last week. And we sat around there talking with some other coaches. And it just got later and later. It was about 11 o'clock at night before we knew it. And we were sitting at the bar there having a couple of Cokes. <laughs> and uh, this beautiful young lady came in. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Just a luscious blonde, and she came right over to where we were, and, and there was a seat beside us, and she said, uh, do you fellas mind if I sit beside you? Well, Danny nearly knocked me off the stool. <laughs> making room for her. Of course, I came around the other side, so she'd be in the middle of that. <laughs> and uh, Danny, the gentleman he is, he said, uh, how are you, young lady? She said, well, I'm not doing too good. He said, well, let me buy you a drink. She said, well, I sure would appreciate it. So he bought her. I said, what do you have? She said, I'll take a double shot of bourbon and, and ginger ale. And then he looked at her and he said, something bothering you? She said, yes, it really is. I'm really depressed. I said, well, what is it? I said, I, I, I can uh, help you. Uh, I counsel a lot of young people. <laughs> She said, well, you really could help me. He said, uh, said uh, to be honest with you, I'm a lady of the night. And this has been a terrible day. He said, uh, I have two children. <laughs> yeah, I know you're all right. The dog has to stand up. <laughs> and she said, things just have not gone right for me today. He said, uh, I had a couple of dates, but they were broken. Said, and you know, if I don't make money, I said, I have a car payment, I have a house payment. I said, uh, could I make you a proposition on something? <laughs> I don't know whether she's talking to me or Danny, but Danny answered right quick. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, that is it. <laughs> she said, well, I, I have a, a car payment due tomorrow. I said, uh, if you would give me $200, I'd do anything that you want me to do. <laughs> Then I said, now run it by me one more time. <laughs> he said, you mean, if I give you $200, you'll do anything I want you to do? That's right. I said, Danny, oh, wait a minute, Dad, be careful. He said, I know what I'm doing. I said, I said well, Danny, remember Deborah and the children? I said, he said, I, I, I am, just don't worry about it. So he said, now one more time, I'm going to give you $200, and you're going to do anything I want you to. She said, that's right. He said, okay. I'll take you up on it. She said, okay, that's a deal. What do you want, darling? He said, I want you to paint my barn. That's <laughs> rude, <laughs> coach in the country that has been more help to the high school coaches, not only in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, all around. And he can go in homes anywhere and feel at home and they feel like he's part of the family. He's the greatest recruiter in the country. And he'll be back, I guarantee you. Good luck. <laughs> Breakfast You'll still be here. Uh, you know, I know you're supposed to go on this cruise Sunday. You and Deborah leave for a Caribbean cruise all week long. And Deborah's been telling about as we plan this party. It's all week long by themselves for the first time in 15 years. Just the two of them. And she's been telling about romantic interludes in the, in the moonlight with the ship and everything. And uh, she even said she'd surprise a couple of negligees that you haven't seen yet. <laughs> I got a couple for her. <laughs>
that's another story. But that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> but, but the bad news is, you know, I know you went for your physical and internal medicine on Wednesday, and you flunked it. <laughs> they got to have you back next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for more physicals. You can't go on your cruise. You cannot go. But I got good news. I'm going for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go uh, to Stan Olenek, who is a five-time sportscaster of the year in South Carolina. Stan? <laughs> this isn't going to work. Yeah. Let me do this. All right. Thank you all. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, spend a little time with my remarks and if you followed along and I know all of you have been good fans for a number of years my career covering Clemson started in a parking lot <laughs> and I feel relatively certain it ended in a and get to the latter or whatever, vice versa. Uh, chances are you got some idea of what I'm talking about. So do a lot of other people. In fact, <laughs> in fact, one of my closest friends in the sportscasting business is a fellow named Warren Pepper, who works in Charleston. He's at Channel 5 down there. Good guy. Love him to death. He's been there about as long as I've been up here. And he called me up a couple days afterwards and he said, you know, he said, I don't envy you. He said, that's the toughest call in sports. And I said, ma'am, I said, this is a fellow pro, someone I have a great deal of respect for, understands the situation. He understands that you have to go after the story, that you've got to find a way not to be rude, not to back down, but to get the information. And I thanked him for that. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, I assumed you were talking about the way I did the story. And Warren was once a college basketball player. He said, no, no, no. He said, I looked at the tape. He said, that's the toughest call in sports, where there was a charge or a block. <laughs> now, let me tell you about the first parking lot in Clemson. The first parking lot was in 1978, outside of Walden Hall. Charlie Pell had just quit. He was gone. He was on a plane to Florida. They had a meeting there, and everybody was walking out. Nobody knew what was going on. Now, keep in mind, back in 1978, the stars of the Clemson football team, even though Charlie Pell had done a good job, was not Charlie Pell. It was Steve Fuller. It was Jerry Butler. It was Joe Bostic. It was Jonathan Brooks. It was on and on and on and on. The coaches just happened to be somebody there at the same time that these great players showed up. And so certainly nobody knew who an assistant coach named Dan Ford was, even though he held the title of assistant head football coach. Well, the meeting breaks up, and we want to find out what happens next. I've got my cameraman with me. We walk up, and there in the parking lot, we see Danny Ford. <coughs> we turn the camera on. We come running up to him with the light. We get ready. We take the microphone. We put it next to him, <laughs> and we ask the logical question. We say, do you want to be head coach at Clemson? And Danny, in his own style, set and set the tone for the next 11 years of Clemson football. He leaned forward, shuffled his feet, spun his head, stuck his head down to the microphone and went, well, uh... <laughs> and of course, you all know the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> now, my job when we got into the coaches show business was to try and take this master of the English language and find a way to convert it so that most normal folks could understand it. <laughs> now, I want you to know, every Tuesday, for years and years and years, we'd go and we'd sit and listen to him talk about the game the past week and what was coming up, and he'd carry on about just all the wonderful things that were happening, and he'd come up with the darndest words, the most amazing things that you had ever heard. 
And when he really hit something that was pretty amazing, and, and Lord knows we stopped about 1980 writing these things down because it just filled notebooks. <laughs> He'd kind of sit back and kind of smile like he had really accomplished something. <laughs> so now he's got a little more time. If any of you invite him over to your house, you know, and you have dinner, and then you're going to play a little parlor game, don't play Scrabble with him, because he really thinks these are words. <laughs> Now, besides helping with the English language, the other thing I had to do was get him presentable for TV every week, okay? His ties are a disaster. They're awful. And I'd say to him, why, you know, every time we'd put him on the interview, I'd get the tie tied up. And I'd say, what's, you know, and he'd go, I ain't ever tied it the same way twice. <laughs> That's an exact quote. I'm a reporter. I can handle this. I said, it's not that tough. He said, I'm left-handed. It don't work for left-handed. <laughs> Anybody out there left-handed who's got a tie on? Is there one? No. Maybe you're right. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Robert. Robert, his wife does it. Oh. Flip <laughs> on. And last year, I knew we were getting near the end of the line because as we both uh, started at a young age, we both aged rapidly. And last year, besides being the English guy, making sure his tie was tied, I also was the makeup man for the coaches show, and I said, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of makeup to cover this now. Yeah. <laughs> and just let me say one word about coaching philosophy. Over the years, there have been a lot of people, critics, media people, fans, who got mad at him for running the football too much. And I said, well, we're going to find out about this. And I went back. <laughs> I did a little research on the uh, days of Danny Ford at Alabama because I had always heard, and he tries to tell everyone that when he was at Alabama, he once played tight end. And he was the second leading receiver on the football team one year. <laughs> and so the idea was, well, this is a guy who comes from a passing philosophy. Why does he run the ball? What's the story? Dennis Holman was the leading receiver with 62 catches. Danny Ford was second with 12. <laughs> You know, but he did catch on to, uh, he did take to coaching pretty well as far as the TV games go. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were looking to do a fishing story. We do fishing stories every Friday. And uh, we went out and we said, well, we ought to go fishing with Danny Ford, you know, the upstate's latest retired millionaire fisherman. <laughs> See what kind of exotic lures or great boats or whatever it is that he had. And he demonstrated an ability to understand and grasp television that none of us had really ever seen in the years before working with him on the coaches show. He went fishing in a pickup truck. <laughs> he went and got him a fish and brought it to us and said, this is the way they do it on them fishing shows. What you do is you get the fish and then you hook it, then you throw it in the water and then you pull it back out and make it look like you caught it. <laughs> and we said, Danny, we can't put that on there. He's, I caught many of them bigger than this. You go ahead. <laughs> So if we'd done that. <laughs> of course, he's got a lot of time to get better at that now. Let me, uh, let me just share a couple of memories with you, because I think that's probably as much of it. When I sat down and started to think of all the funny stuff, and oddball stuff, that kind of stuff, uh, the things that first came to mind were some of the things that happened early, like that parking lot interview, like, uh, oh, 1982 at the Orange Bowl. And looking back as uh, the crush of the press and the players go into the press area to be interviewed, and all of a sudden hearing a little voice from behind a fence going, Stan, 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 and looking around and seeing Deborah stuck against the fence <laughs> outside of the press area with 100 million fans behind her trying to convince a security guard that she's the coach's wife and ought to be let in. <laughs> had the same problem, thought it was just, you know, one of the Clemson youngsters, so we went back and got her to come in. I can remember standing in Charlotte at Shrine Bowl practices and freezing, standing in the rain, because Danny was going to go there to recruit, and that's where he'd hold his pre-bowl press conferences. You'd have to go to Charlotte to talk to him about the bowl, because nothing was going to get in the way of recruiting. And I can remember one time having the lady at our front desk, we're when I was at Channel 7, being at I-26 and 85, the crossroads, having the lady at the front desk call up and say, 
oh, there's a man out here who wants to see you. And I said, well, what is he? He said, well, I don't know, but he says he's got to see you real bad. And I said, well, I'm kind of busy. I'll run right out there. And so I come out there, and it is Danny, and he goes, hey, bud, how are you? Where's the bathroom? <laughs> Those long recruiting trips from North Carolina, you know, you gotta have some pit stop, and that was it. <laughs> Calling his office and getting him on the speakerphone. Any of you ever do that? Where he's absolutely unintelligible, right? And then you tell him to pick up the phone and talk to you, and it doesn't get much better. <laughs> and some great times, like sending out a photographer to get some pictures of him sitting with his new son Lee. Where's Lee? He's around here somewhere. And kind of kind of musing over it and looking at him and uh, pulling on his leg and saying, well, he doesn't look like he's going to be a quarterback. And that's probably good because he'd probably want to throw the ball too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and when the end came, we went out to the farm to talk to him about a couple of things. And we got two very typical Ford answers. You know, when something happens, you always want to get a good side to it. You want to find a way to find something positive. And I said, Danny, is there anything good that has come out of this? And he said, yes, sir. He said, I ain't going to be the first SOB to lose to Virginia. <laughs> and I said, is there anything bad? And he alluded to it. He said, yeah. He said, I probably won't hear, hey, coach, you're no, your money's no good here as much anymore. <laughs> Let me just close with a couple of just final thoughts on all of this. Um, you know, a lot of times when the good times are going along, you don't pay much attention to them. You just kind of get on with it, roll with the tide, and enjoy it. <laughs> and I think maybe that's why I couldn't come up with any better stories, because I was having a good time just absolutely enjoying it all. Over the years, and doing the coaches' show especially, and years before that, just in covering Clemson sports, it never was working with different people. It was always working with friends, with co-workers, people who became very important. Now, Jane told you a little bit about the coaches' show, and there are a couple of people who did a very good job making all of us look very good. A fellow named David Yao, a guy named Gene Crisella. They were just absolutely super. Uh, Jane played down her importance. You know, she always brings a sparkle and an energy to the work that made it seem like anything but work. And of course, Danny, win, lose, draw, tie, good, bad, indifferent, he had the confidence to pretty much let us go ahead and do things the way we needed to. And I think because of that, we were able to give Clemson perhaps one of the best media fronts anywhere in the country for several years. without getting terribly sentimental, one of the things that I remember and probably stands out more than anything is going to bowl games, going to big games, and being around writers from other areas. When you play Oklahoma, you play Nebraska, Stanford, whatever it is, and they'd come in, and they'd always want to talk to Danny about big games, about what it was like to win the big ones. And you know, he always used to have a line that he'd say, and I, uh, maybe some of you have heard it, that he really didn't remember much about the wins, but he never forgot the losses. He always used to say that. You know, and fortunately for all of us, we're just the other way. We don't remember any of those losses. We just remember the wins. We remember the big times, the bowl games, the championships, the fun. And hopefully, maybe now that he's one of us for a little while, he'll be able to remember those things too. Thank you all. Thank you. sophisticated and urbane. Uh, but honestly, honestly, right, on the sea, right underneath the surface of the surface, he, he's still living country. Uh, no, I promise you he is. Uh, 
I went, and I had occasion to witness both of those things uh, several years ago. Went with Danny down to Buford, South Carolina. He was recruiting a tight end. And the, the tight end was Roberts, and he lived with his maternal grandmother. And it was Clemson, Georgia Tech. And then the boy and his grandmother had been to Atlanta the weekend before, and they had a great visit. They had a great visit. And, and Danny kind of figured that out. We might lose a, a great blocking uh, tackle to a tight end was going to a Georgia Tech. And so Danny was talking to Ms. Roberts. Uh, he said, you know, there's a lot of crime and drugs in Atlanta. And Ms. Uh, Roberts allowed, well, you know, Danny, there's a lot of crime and, and uh, drugs right here in Buford. And so uh, Danny just, he just, I mean, he's like a revivalist preacher now. He's starting to get into it. He says, Ms. Roberts, you know, uh, they got women in Atlanta. I hear tell uh, stand on the street corners and they, uh, they'll have sex for money down there. And Ms. Roberts, you know what they call those women? And Ms. Roberts didn't know. And Danny said, uh, well, they call those women hookers. He said, you know, Ms. Roberts, you go down to Atlanta and you can see some men walking down the street hugging and kissing one another. And you know what they call those men, Ms. Roberts? Ms. Roberts said she didn't, she didn't know. And Danny said, they call them gays. And Danny was rolling now. He said, Ms. Roberts, they even got women down in Atlanta. You go down there and they'll be holding hands walking down the street kissing one another. And Ms. Roberts, you know what they call those women? And Ms. Roberts, she just didn't know. She said, Ms. Roberts, they call them lesbians. And, and Ms. Roberts spoke up. She says, Danny, in Atlanta, they got these men that you can give money to and they'll kiss women on their private parts. And you know what they call them? And Danny goes, dang, no, Ms. Roberts, what do they call them? She said, when I got my breath back, I called them sugar. <laughs> Georgia Tech caught touchdown pants in this last year. <laughs> Ms. Roberts is in graduate school down there, too. That's <laughs> 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 true story, Diane. Right? Our That's next speaker <laughs> is the winningest quarterback in Clemson football history and the most valuable player in two of our biggest bowl victories, Rodney Williams. get up here and talk all day. But uh, they told me I only got about 10 minutes. This would actually be any player's dream, to get up here and talk about your coach and not have to worry about what he's going to do. <laughs> so what I've been doing the last uh, last three or four weeks is I'm still in this area and there's a lot of ex-players around here and asking them, could they tell me the, the funniest story or, or just a story because every story about Coach Ford is funny in most of our minds. <laughs> And you know, they, they'd tell me things and all this, and it, and it seemed like the same thing over and over. So I decided not to tell you any stories because so many of them are, you had to be there on the field, you know, when he threw a piece of the back at you, hit you, you know, or, or kicked you in the butt and said, get up, get up, something like that. But uh, there was one time, we have many golfers in here. Anyway, I play golf. And obviously Coach Ford does not play golf. He thinks that's a sissy sport or country club country club sport. So uh, whenever you hit a golf ball, if you hit it too far, most people talk to their golf ball. They get down, get down, get down, or get up, get up, get up. We're on perimeter one day, which is when we're, I think it's like five minutes out of the whole three hour practice, we practice throwing the ball. <laughs> <laughs> so we're out right there, you know, don't perimeter. So I drop back or play, uh, no drop back, play action, excuse me. Play action. And throw the ball, and I'm Holler at the ball, get down, get down, get down. He looks over at me and goes, that ball ain't got ears, just throw the damn thing. <laughs> and I can, I can go on and on about different stories. Look at that. <laughs> For a man that, that all of us knew loved us to death, but when we got on that field, this man was a tyrant. I mean, he would just, he would treat you, well, I can't tell him what he treated treat like, but, we all knew it was for our best. You know, he pushed us as hard as we could be pushed sometimes. We'd be throwing up on the side and he'd... Matter of fact, he called... His nickname for me was Mama's Boy. I don't know how I think because he kind of knew my family or something. But the whole time, come on, Mama's Boy, get up, Mama's Boy, throw the ball, Mama's Boy. I don't know how he did that or why. Why did you call me Mama's Boy? <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> 
Good. Let me see if I can think of something that's funny. Um, the way he dresses, this. I swear to God, he came out. We got some. No, okay, I'm sorry. I swear. My freshman year went to the Independence Bowl. Had a good time. Obviously, didn't play very well. We got these ugly, or uh, ugly brown sweats, custom fit supposedly, tailor made. Didn't fit anybody, but Coach Ford. <laughs> I mean, nobody, the only thing people would do with them from then on, they cut them up, maybe wear them for shorts in the sauna or something. Coach Ford wore them things to this day, I bet you still have them. <laughs> Same pair of shoes. Coach DeAndre alluded to something earlier. He said, uh, he said, in the springtime, we always knew when there was a calf due because practice would be short. <laughs> He treated his cows better than us. <laughs> I got that from his family over there. So. Uh, coach, had a real great time. Um, I wanted to say a lot of bad things up here. But uh, let me tell you one thing about the Virginia game. We mentioned the Virginia game. If anybody doesn't know this, Alabama, for a long time, had never lost to Vanderbilt and to Coach Ford's senior year. <laughs> the first time ever they lost to Vanderbilt. From, it had to be since 78, since we, he's been head coach. Every year, the exact same speech. We played Vanderbilt when I was a senior. <laughs> coach Brian told us we never lost to Vanderbilt. We were the first senior class to lose to Vanderbilt. You don't want to be the first senior class to lose to Vanderbilt. So since my freshman year, the biggest fear, it wasn't Two a days, it wasn't going out and running a mile and a half, it wasn't anything but losing to Virginia. It was every year he got up there. 27 and 0. You seniors? I was a senior in Alabama and we lost to Virginia. That's me. To this day, that's the senior's biggest nightmare. Except when you get the Virginia game over, it's like, all right, we can get rid of the rest of the season. ACC doesn't mean anything, bowl doesn't mean anything, as long as you beat Virginia. And as y'all know, when we went up there my senior year, we came real close not to doing that. But uh, we got a little lucky because they messed up and uh, didn't cover the guy. Oh, they weren't expecting a pass. <laughs> something blues about two minutes ago I swear to God every play call was square <laughs> every play call was an option the option we had to we need to go to the right or left but every play option 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 come up to the line this particular play is an option call and they just happened to run a defense and leave a guy wide open or we wouldn't have thrown the ball in so <laughs> it wasn't his call is what I'm saying <laughs> Uh, after that game, speaking of Miss Ford, um, his better half, uh, she made me feel real, real good. We were on the bus, and as usual, the plane was late. We always have to wait on the plane. And I happened to be sitting, I think, right behind uh, Miss Ford. And she looked around at us. She goes, Roddy, we really love you. And that made me feel so good to know that, you know, because it never shows any, any emotion right now. <laughs> he, just, he just looks at you and goes, uh, good catch. Good. <laughs> Never told me I threw a good pass. Always a great catch. It's <laughs> a true story, that. Eh? <laughs> One of the other quarterbacks are throwing him a great throw. I throw a pass. Good catch, Coop. Good job. <laughs> but all the, all the former players I've talked to, you know, all have the same, the highest regards to Coach Ford. One of the things that a lot of people mention, and this is, something that probably a lot of y'all don't know, but you know how down to earth he is. But there's a lot of head coaches out there, like uh, I had a couple friends that went to Georgia, to, to Virginia, and they always talked about how the, the head coach was like on a pedestal. You know, he was like here, or like we are, and, you know, and the players was always, yes sir, yes sir. Well, Coach Ford would always, when the practice was over or something, he'd go in and he'd make a joke with you, and you could, you could play around with him a little bit. And that, was so unusual to all these other places that went to Virginia, they were like, you mean you can actually, you know, say nice shirt or that's ugly tie or something like that. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we do that all the time. And they're like, you know, we wouldn't even consider saying that to Coach Dooley. 
And I said, well, I said, well, re probably the reason Coach Ford doesn't put himself on a pedestal is because he doesn't know what that means. <laughs> close real quick here but I want to clarify something this uh, Danny board thing first time I heard him this uh, youngsters and stuff he never talked to us like that and the first few three or four times hearing Danny board is I was like that didn't sound anything like coach Ford but if you listen to coach Ford on the radio that's what he sounds like one-on-one <laughs> on one, and when he's talking to you, you know he doesn't call us youngsters or something he, every once in a while he says young people or something but, or used to it um, <laughs> A lot of people in Clemson are going to miss you. Um, I know I will. Well, I've already missed you. Because um, I haven't had anybody cuss me out in a while. <laughs> Talking talk about my heritage and stuff like that. <laughs> but Clemson family is going to miss you. Yeah, I'm working in this area up here. And everybody, every single, when they find out who I am, the first question is, you know, what's Coach Ford doing? Have you talked to Coach Ford? So. Everybody's real concerned and, and hope you get back into coaching. Except some lady told me to tell you today that she heard that you were going down a little bit south of here and she said that you just could not do that. <laughs> uh, she thought better of you than that. <laughs> but, uh, but we'll miss you and uh, good luck in the future, whether you're a tiger or, or whatever it may be. I know you got a great family behind you. And let's see, you've only got one house now, right? <laughs> we know where to find you. On the lake, in the woods back there. Got rid of the... What'd you do with all that furniture? <laughs> Put it in that barn. True story, that, that barn is probably nicer than our dorm. <laughs> Get better, Dan? <laughs> Deb, would you want to say a few words here? No. <laughs> she sure had an earful for you the other morning. <laughs> she called me Thursday morning. Do you remember Thursday morning, don't you? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> she called and said, Friday night's off. I said, why? I said, well, Danny got in at 4 o'clock. And she said, I had to get up at 7. And he's still in the bed. I'm going to go kill him. <laughs> I said, Deborah, don't do that. A lot of people are coming. Way to go on the cruise. And you can easily go to the side. You know, and nobody ever find the body. So uh, she listened to reason there for a little while. Um, are you sure you don't have anything to say? No. Okay. <laughs> now, this man has called me three or four times. And he first wanted to move the location of this roast to Death Valley. He said, I'll put 20,000 people in there myself. I said, Coach Howard, I I'm kind of busy. And he called back a couple days later, wanted more free tickets. Um, <laughs> and then more, and then more. Um, and said, now this is a roast, did it? I said, yes, sir, it's a roast. He said, I'm going to chap him. I'm going to chap him. I said, now, coach, there's going to be women here. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's turn it over to the legend himself. Coach. assistant before taking over as the head coach from Charlie Pell. He was at Alabama two times, the Eisenhower and the Nixon time. <laughs> when he went to Alabama, he took his clothes in a paper sack. When he got close to Tuscaloosa, he stopped 
got him another paper sack at a Dixie store. And you know, he was the only boy entering Alabama that year that had batching luggage. <laughs> He was born in Gadsden, Alabama. Population was 990, and it never changes. Down there, every time a baby is born, a man leaves town. His, his father was a cotton farmer. The crops were so bad, they went to Georgia to import bull weevils. <laughs> when he was a young boy, he chewed tobacco, and still does. <laughs> and I tell you, he was so level-headed that he had tobacco juice running out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. <laughs> his granddaddy came over from the old country and knew only three words. Stick them up. <laughs> in Gaston, his family had four rooms and a path. <laughs> they had carpet to the bathroom and they liked it so well, they put it in the house. <laughs> wrote seal and rope up for some toilet paper. <laughs> they wrote it back and said they'd need the number of rolls and the color and they were closing, in closing a catalog. Please order immediately. He wrote them back, said, since you sent the catalog, I don't need to talk to you. <laughs> he went to school in Gadsden, Alabama, and he was, went out for football. But one day he went in and told the coach, he said, Coach, my feet hurt. <laughs> coach told him, said, well, Danny, wear a clean pair of socks every day. So after about a month, he went back to the coach and said, Coach, I'm quitting. He said, why, Danny? He said, I can't get my shoes on. <laughs> When he got to Tuscaloosa, he checked in a Holiday Inn. Had never been anywhere and decided to go out and see the town. He got lost. Called the Holiday Inn, told he lost. They said, where are you, Danny? He said, well, I'm at the corner of Walk Street and Don't Walk Street. <laughs> In Gaston, Alabama, it was so hot that the cows gave powdered milk. <laughs> the other day, uh, I was telling him about the two beautiful girls that lived next door to me. I said that the most beautiful girls I ever saw, always together. I never see any boys around. He looked at me and says, Coach, do you think they was Lebanese? <laughs> And the president of Clemson, he looked at him, he says, thanks a million, boy. <laughs> you know, he got rid of all the pigs out on his farm. He's uh, going to put in tobacco. And you know, the government uh, gives a subsidy on tobacco, and he can just get paid and not grow the stuff. <clears throat> He's mercenary. <coughs> Is that a good word for you? You never heard those big words before. <laughs> well, I tell you one. I tell you one thing. Uh, I was talking to him about what he was going to do. He said he's getting as far away from football as possible. King, you him? King, he said he's moving to Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> You know, I recruited King, too. One of the worst things I ever did. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about Ford now. You know, that boy, 
He's too good to coach at just one school. He ought to be like I used to talk about Bear Bryant. He ought to be a psychic coach. Uh, he ought to coach on Tennessee on Monday, Duke on Tuesday, Georgia on Wednesday, Alabama on Thursday, Penn State on Friday, and we'll let him come back to Clemson on Saturday. <laughs> closing let me say what a fine job Danny did at Clemson. Uh, he was the youngest coach to ever win a bowl game. I don't think he was about 30 years old. He didn't look like he was driving in between the ears, to tell you the truth. <laughs> His teams have beat Ohio State, Penn State, Stanford, Nebraska, Notre Dame. And I didn't mention the many times he'd beat them game cops. <laughs> USC means, don't you? University of steroids and cocaine. <laughs> Danny's teams has also had many AC championships and played in many bowl games and put many people in Death Valley. Wait a minute. All of us hate to see him leave. I don't know whether that's true or not. <laughs> But it is far as I'm concerned. But we do want to wish you good luck, um, Danny, in all your future undertakings. And we we'll wish you that good luck, even if you do move to Columbia, <laughs> which we don't think you will. <laughs> and I want to say right now, good luck. We're sorry you're gone. And I think this gathering tonight will show you what people think of you at Clemson. And before I sit down, I got to introduce my little nurses. You know, I got some nurses over here. And this little girl right here has got the sharpest needle you ever see. Stand up there, girl. You and that other do. Hey, come on, come on. I went to the doctor over in Anderson the other day and she liked to kill me. I swore I'd never go back, but maybe I will. <laughs> now I got two or three more folks here. If I got Bell here, fold you. Why Bell here? There he is. And how about Bill Thomas? Now this Bill Thomas boys is <clears throat> one of my Pennsylvania boys. And believe it or not, it took me two years to get a headgear on him. <laughs> he came down to Clemson with a miner's light on him. <laughs> and he wouldn't take it off. And now we've got our coffee man, Jim Inslee. Where are you? Oh, he's already gone, huh? Where's Jim? He's not here? <laughs> well, that's a good place for him to go. <laughs> uh, oh, I got a lot of football. How many of you boys played football with me? Stand up. Hell, I don't think you ever played, did you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I would call your name, but I can't see out that far. <laughs> and we've got some, a lot of folks from that lake department here. Got some pretty little old girls. How about it, Martha? You and Pat and Sandy and all of you stand up and let these folks see. quit when Ford did. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh. And Danny, good luck to you, boy. And if I ever need any money, I'll know where to come by. <laughs> note here about Coach Howard. Let me just read it to you. The South Carolina Multiple Sclerosis Society, you couldn't say that, uh, presents an evening for distinguished South Carolinians honoring Coach uh, Frank Howard, who received the National Multiple Sclerosis Society's Hope Award uh, at a reception Thursday, September 13, 1990, at the Greenville uh, Spartanburg Airport Marriott, 85 in Pelham Road, uh, from 7 to 9 o'clock here in Greenville. Uh, if you would like to attend, uh, I've got a whole host of information up here for you, and uh, we'll all see you there so we can honor Coach Howard.
do what I can do. <laughs> Great job, Coach. Oh, oh, Rolfo Scruggs is all right. Now, we have a young lady here taping this night. We're going to give this tape to you, by the way, Danny, uh, so you can look uh, look back on this a little bit later. It's so not one of my fondest memories. <laughs> And several of you inquired about uh, perhaps getting a tape. If you just see me afterwards, we'll, we'll try to do that uh, for you. Uh, let's see, a presentation now. What do we have here? They gave me a Jaguar for every coach. Don't tell me. <laughs> 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 they gave me a car <laughs> And you traded for pickup truck even. <laughs> this is from the office of the governor. Uh, dear Coach Ford, Governor. the Governor, <laughs> Dear Coach Ford, on behalf of the state of South Carolina, I am pleased to extend my sincere thanks for your efforts and the acclaim you won on behalf of Clemson University. This success was a direct reflection on your discipline, spirit, and leadership as you trained young people to work as one unit, a team. The values of teamwork and determination that you instilled in each of these players served to inspire our young people to perform to their fullest potential. While this success was proof that our young athletes can compete with the best in the nation, your commitment to the student athlete helped lay the groundwork for future growth of the program. The Clemson Tigers have represented the Palmetto State well, and I applaud your success. Please accept my warmest wishes for continued success, and do not hesitate to contact me if I may be of assistance to you in the future. Sincerely, Carol Campbell, Governor. City of Greenville, Office of the Mayor. Proclamation. Whereas Danny Ford will be honored by friends, family, co workers, and team members on Friday, August 10th, 1990, for his 11 years as head coach of the Clemson University football team. And whereas Ford is the fifth winningest football coach in the decade of the 80s, and is the third winningest active coach in football with a record of 96, 29, and 4. And whereas Ford has coached five ACC championship teams, one national championship team, and has a 6 2 bowl record has set an ACC record with 18 victories over top 20 teams, and whereas Ford was selected as the National Coach of the Year and as the youngest coach to ever win a national championship, and whereas it is only fitting that Danny Ford be recognized for his athletic coaching ability and dedication to bringing Clemson football to national acclaim. Now, therefore, I, W.D. Workman III, Mayor of the City of Greenville, South Carolina, do hereby proclaim August 10th, 1990 is Danny Ford Day in the city of Greenville. In witness whereof, I have hereto here set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Greenville to be affixed the 7th date of August 1990. Plus, you have the key to the city. So, Bill DeAndre, you had something for Coach Ford tonight from the uh, your coaching staff. Coach DeAndrea is going to make a little note here from the uh, Danny's former staff. Bill? The reason I'm not up here, Coach, is uh, they wanted you roasted, not fried. <laughs> I can tell a lot about you, Bill. <laughs> I can tell a lot about you, too, Coach, but they were all good times. And uh, this is uh, a note, basically, from, uh, from the staff. Uh, his assistant coaches, uh, I can speak uh, on behalf of them tonight. Most all of them have called me, asked me if I was going. And uh, I can just say that uh, it was a joy and a pleasure to, to work for Danny Ford. And uh, I'm not here to roast them. I can tell you a whole bunch of stories like the time we went recruiting and Big Doberman pinched her out in the front yard, told me to go on up there and knock on the door and see if it's the right place. <laughs> I'm going to read this, and this is from our staff, and uh, just a note from your former staff to say thanks for all you did for us and our families. During the good times and the bad times, you were there, from cutting pumpkins with our kids on Halloween to the summer dedication parties on the road. We were with you and believed in you totally, from trying to run something other than the sweep to throwing the first play of the game against Penn State. We knew you were with us, from putting the Holiday Inn in the airport, airport off limits to our coaches um, and the Thursday night barbecue, we knew we tested your patience, but somehow you pulled everything back together. Toughness, togetherness, and hard-nosed football was our trademark, and all of us ended up with, a winning, with winning the final goal. 
all the wonderful things you did for the underprivileged or the sick made us realize that no matter how busy you were, you always had time for everyone, no matter who they were. So many times we stood back and watched you as you hugged the kid, messed his hair up, hugged an older person, or visited with someone with terminal illness. We saw the joy you brought each of these people, and we admire you for being just Andy Ford, our Andy Ford. Why don't we let you talk? Well, all right, Danny. You're up. Try it. <laughs> I don't know that uh, I'm going to take time to do all these people because several of them are gone and several of them wasn't any good to begin with. <laughs> This thing cost fifteen dollars a piece, but I wouldn't. I want my money back. Wouldn't have it. No, I, I'm going to try to be uh, not, you know, just uh, a little bit on each one of these people and, and all of my very dear friends here. First of all, my family. Uh, let's see, Lee. Let me, uh, come here, Lee. Get up here, boy. <laughs> let me show you. Let me tell you a story about Lee. He came on the wrong day. He was supposed to come on Saturday when we were playing Duke, so we gave him some medicine. Dr. Smith did. And he's here tonight and made him come on, on Thursday where I could go to the ball game. <laughs> We're very glad uh, for Dr. Smith and Clemson, and, and we won the ball game too on that. Uh, let's see, Ashley. There's a second girl, Elizabeth. First, Elizabeth, stand up. Elizabeth was born after. I'll tell you a story about Elizabeth. She was born in Greenville Hospital. Stand up, baby. And uh, I, I didn't have time to go pick her up at the hospital, so we sent the highway patrolman to get her. <laughs> Her and Mama, of course, Blake Griffiths with the highway, the ex highway commissioner. Now we don't do that no more, do we? <laughs> the, uh, the second one, a uh, girl was uh, Elizabeth uh, Ashley. Excuse me, I'm about to learn all the names again. Uh, and Ashley uh, was born in Blacksburg, Virginia, and uh, she's uh, she was a tenth grader at Daniel High School in, in uh, Clemson this year. Thank you, Ashley. The next one is Jennifer. She's a senior. She was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And uh, she will be a senior in high school, and she will, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get her in school somewhere. She's like her daddy a little bit right there, but she... <laughs> Sit down, Jen. <Jenny. laughs> she don't have all... She, she, she'll do real well, though, because she got daddy's personality. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Deborah, you know, of course, my brother Bob and his wife Judy is here from uh, tell you a story about them, how, how, how the good Lord blessed us. Stand up. He was in gas. Stand up just a second. He's, he's a golfer, but that's, other than that, he don't do much. <laughs> when we were at Clemson, uh, we went home to gas and population 990, as Coach Howard said, and uh, he was going to Turkey with Goodyear planning and for, for 12 years, her mother was ill. And she, uh, in and out, so uh, they took him to Turkey to start a Goodyear plant. He was over there for 12 months, supposed to have come back. And then, anyway, ended up been over there by 18 months. They wouldn't let him come home. And finally, they gave him a choice 
of, uh, he said mother was sick and he was coming home where he had to retire or didn't retire. And, uh, and they gave him a choice of going to New Mexico, uh, Canada with Goodyear, or Spartanburg, South Carolina. So you can guess which one he, he chose. So he was with Goodyear and Spartanburg. We were glad to get him back in this country around us a little bit and, and, and have him here. But uh, we appreciate everybody coming out. And, and Jane's gone. I can't say much about Jane's a super girl. She did, she did a great job. The reason Jane liked me so well is because I let her date one of my football players one time. And she's, a, she's a really just a, a, a cradle robber. She was a senior and he was a freshman. Uh, and, but but uh, he couldn't handle her. <laughs> it wasn't ever going to work, so we tried to break that up real early. And, and we did. And, and she was talking about that, uh, that, that sack I used to have on the mirror. I got it on my old truck. I got a new truck. I had I got two trucks now. Uh, but uh, I had a truck that uh, a friend of mine gave me. Again, I can't tell you who it was, but he's in a high position of authority too. <laughs> and uh, see, when SMU dropped football, I, I told uh, two of them to go to Dallas, Texas, and bring us a football player back. And we found out about it a day before everybody else found out about it. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, two of them wanted to go to Dallas, and then four of them wanted to go to Dallas. And SMU was playing great football. And I said, well, we might need more than one to go. We might need more than two. But I know we don't need four. But anyway, they talked me into letting four of them go out there. So we must have spent. On, on expenses, money, travel, food, lodging. We must have spent, or you people spent, I, I was always worried about budget too, and uh, worried about how much money we spent. And uh, we must have spent $6,000 going out there by the time they ate and hotel and travel and everything else. And, I kept saying, well, when are you gonna get some of them SMU boys to visit Clemson? And they said, well, we're talking to four of them, but I don't know if any of them are going to visit. But Coach, he said, we did bring you a gift. And they bought that sack and, and uh, I mean, that, that, that thing. At <laughs> uh, the Dallas airport, it was called a Texas garbage can. That's what they called it. And that's the only thing I got that reminds me of the SMU dropping football. So, uh, Jane never did tell the rest of that study. Buddy King, of course, was our, one of our coaches, and, and, and Buddy didn't tell you everything. Buddy, boy, Buddy was so loyal to Clemson University. I tried to hire Buddy maybe four or five times back at Clemson, and, and uh, I didn't have quite the authority to, uh, to, to, to let me hire him back because uh, at Clemson, they didn't want you to hire who you wanted to hire. They wanted you to hire who they thought you thought you could coach. And, uh, <laughs> must, must I say that uh, Buddy was one of the best football coaches I ever had, and he was so loyal to uh, <laughs> he was so loyal to Clemson uh, that uh, and, and Coach Howard. He named his uh, youngest, oldest boy. And Howard, would you stand up? This is Coach Howard's uh, namesake. This is Howard King. <laughs> But Buddy, Buddy didn't tell you about Kansas when he did. He did really, really did. We told him to leave after we played South Carolina. That was after the Orange Pants uh, game and, and everything. And, and Buddy left and stayed like five and a half weeks and got three speed tickets uh, <laughs> and because it was so flat. That radar, you know, <laughs> but he also brought back a guy named Johnny Rember. And uh, it, uh, I don't know that you remember it or not, but I do. Uh, we were about to get beat by North Carolina. And he ran through on a blitz and caused a fumble going in. I can remember him against Nebraska intercepting the pass. I can remember him doing a lot of things. Uh, and Buddy also recruited a guy named Jeff Davis, who probably turned their football career around at Clemson. He had a guy named Homer Jordan. Uh, he had the state of North Carolina. He got so many tickets, speed tickets in the state of North Carolina, that he can't ever drive back through North Carolina. <laughs> 
They have a warrant now for his arrest in every county. But he brought a lot of football players back to Clemson. And then when you start talking about Andy Head, when you talk about all those people that came from North Carolina, it wasn't nobody but Buddy King. And Buddy did a hell of a job in North Carolina. And uh, he, he made North Carolina what we call uh, a primary recruitment area of South Carolina because it was four-hour radius. Anything was in four-hour radius of Clemson, we felt like we had to have. And that covered Greensboro. North Carolina. So, uh, Buddy was a great person, great coach. He left Clemson under the NCAA investigation because uh, they, they said that, uh, I don't know, he, he, he volunteered to leave before he, he should have left and he went to uh, uh, the World Football League, I think. Went out to Arizona and then went to a couple places, Wake Forest, South Carolina, but Buddy will be back coaching again before too long, I hope. And uh, he, he's a very loyal Clemson person, done a great job, and probably the, as much a success of anybody's ever been at, at, at Clemson. Uh, Bill Clark, he told you a lot of the truth. We did go, He uh, our first game with Woody Hayes and Charlie Bowman, that was a lie. Uh, <laughs> what he didn't tell you, and what people probably don't remember, and I can remember a lot of it as we go, because things come back to me. Uh, when you have time to sit around and think a little bit. But uh, it's, it's amazing. I can remember Jim Stuckey blocking the uh, extra point, which was a big turning point in the football game. I can remember Jonathan Brooks making some big plays. But I remember Charlie Bowman for the rest of my life. Uh, and I went home with Charlie right after that and went to his family's home in New Jersey and, and, uh, and, and landed in, in, uh, in, in Camden up there, I believe is where he was, uh, outside of Camden, but, uh, or Philadelphia, one of them, I forget which one. But uh, went to home and all the newspaper people bothered him and called him and all this kind of thing. But uh, Charlie was supposed to have been rushing the passer. <laughs> and I don't know if you know this or not, but he was supposed to be rushing the passer and he got blocked so far downfield <laughs> that when he got double teamed by the right guard in the center that it, it knocked him about six yards down the field. And when he stood up, they had a tight end delay that came across the middle. And, and he stood up, and the quarterback didn't expect to see the nose guard there, so he didn't have a misread <laughs> on the coverage. And Bowman intercepted, and he got the hell blocked out of it. <laughs> and when he ran over to the bench, he wasn't being disrespectful. But you ain't never heard of a nose guard intercepting the ball, uh, 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 a quarterback, so he was just jumping up and down. He wasn't being respectful, respect, uh, disrespectful for uh, Coach Hayes. He was just being so happy for himself. And uh, he should have been. He got a minus on the play, but he won the football game. <laughs> and Sonny uh, uh, and, and, and Phil would come to the to the uh, practices every year and, and, and the beach of where we were and he, he was kidding about and I got a chance to throw a couple of gags and, and digs at people and I'll do that now uh, as we go but uh, he was talking about the barn the barn ain't nice that I built but it's damn right nice in that dorm we lived in. <laughs> we had the only athletic dorm in the country that had a Tampax machine in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> it was a 35-year-old dorm, but there, there used to be a girl's dorm, and it never even cleaned it up. But uh, my my barn ain't bad, I'll tell you. Uh, but that wasn't a big deal. That that leg dorm wasn't that big a deal. I mean, that was a deer. Uh, but uh, the hay barn, Woody McCorvey. Woody McCorvey was our black coach. My black coach, I didn't have a black or white coach. I had a guy over there came to Clemson one time uh, last year, uh, one of them equal opportunity employer guys. And he said, uh, you need more black coach. I said, man, I don't have no black coaches. I got white, black, pink, I got people. I don't have black, white football players, I got people. 
He said, well, the basketball team's got two black coaches. I said, I don't have I said, Woody ain't black. <laughs> Woody's my best friend. And the only way that I would get on Woody all the time is because he the only one that understood what I was saying. <laughs> I talked to Woody last week. I talked to uh, Tommy West, wrote me a letter last week. Uh, Lindsay called Deborah yesterday. Uh, uh, Chuck called out of Baylor the other day. I got his dog. You know, we were real close staff. He, he said uh, he was going to Dallas, Te he was going to Waco, Texas, and he had uh, two, it was, it was sad time, but it was funny time. It was a lot of things going on. He had the girls spent the night with us. They, they didn't want to leave the house. They spent the night on the floor, the last night in their house. They got a little two-door car. They got three little old girls. They got flower pots in the back seat. They got a cat in the front seat. He, got, he forgot to put his propane gas tank in the, in the moving van, so he had it in the back seat, had everything tied out. He didn't even going to put a black lap tied up in the trunk. And I said, Chuck, that, that dog won't make it to Atlanta. And I said, when he makes it to Atlanta, you're going to have to stop and water him every hour. So you got to be in Waco by Friday. You're going to get there next next three weeks. He said, okay, Cody. He said, well, you keep him. I said, Chuck, I'm going to tell you something. I'll keep your dog, but I don't want your dog. I don't want any more animals, and I don't want your dog. But I'll find him a good home. It's not. I, I want you to keep him for me. Put him on a plane. I gotta buy a dog thing to put him in. <laughs> and it's gonna cost me a $200 airline ticket, but I want you to bring him down there. And I said, fine, Chuck, I'll do it. So I tied a dog up the first day at the lake. He got loose and ran away. I thought I was gonna have to shoot him. But uh, I finally got him back, carried him out to the farm, tied him up to a put him in the barn in the stable and he stayed there and dug his way out and then finally I said, well, I don't care if the dog goes off or not. But uh, Chuck called back three weeks ago, been about a month now and I still got that dog and Chuck said, Coach, he said, there ain't a tree out here in Dallas, I mean in Waco. He said, that dog would die out here. I said, I, said, I guess I own another dog, don't you? <laughs> so we, we got to get Chuck back together where I can get rid of that dog. But, uh, but Woody and all them people that coached for me, they were great people. Phil talked about that blonde in the bar. Uh, that was not a true story at all. <laughs> uh, the only reason I went to bars and hung around all that was because that's where all the coaches were. <laughs> <laughs> and as you, and as, if you notice, Phil probably talked to my wife and told her he was going to tell that story. And she went to the hair, hair beauty parlor or whatever you call them for things. And she got her hair lightened. <laughs> She had a little light he put on that hair. <laughs> Stan Olenek, uh, uh, you know, Stan's a good friend of mine. I don't mind telling you, Stan's a friend of mine. We didn't start out that way, but he, uh, you know, because I never trusted anybody in the news or sports or anywhere else. Um, but Stan did a great job. And when we had the quarterback club in, in, in Greenville, uh, with the, honoring the all ACC people and everything else, that uh, uh, one of the guys got up and they were introducing they have the Jacob Blocking Award, which goes to the best football offensive player in the state of South Carolina. Uh, and then they got the best one in, in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And, and they nominated Stan to win the most improved blocking award trophy. <laughs> Well, it really wasn't that bad. He did a, he did what he thought he had to do, and that's all right. As long as you do what you have to do, you got to do what you have to do. Whether you think it's right or wrong, you got to do what you have to do. Uh, our fishing show, uh, that was that was right. But I did catch the fish. I went to the farm and caught it about three hours before because I wanted to make a good impression. I need to change my image, don't you know? <laughs> so I thought I. Do something very positive. Orange Bowl, we, we, I can remember that like it was yesterday. My wife had brought me a brand new green blazer, and I don't, I wear very plain clothes because I saw the meal made in Georgia where I got them wholesale or retail, whatever, or the cheapest price they sold them, whichever way that was. <laughs> I'd buy them by the dozens, and they lost, lasted me about three or four years, and, and I'd buy a white shirt by the dozen, and when they got, you know, too little, I just 
wear them some more, not button them, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, save me a lot of money by doing it like that. But I can remember she bought me a beautiful green coat. And we were staying in the hotel, and there was a canal right there. And the press conference for the Orange Bowl was right across the canal. And Nebraska was staying right in another hotel. But we'd already lost our two luggages for the little two oldest girls, and they didn't have any clothes. The airlines <coughs> lost them. So we, I had my pretty green coat on that my wife got me. It was a matching tie and had a pair of blue pants. And I was looking at that canal, and I didn't, you know, I was just, to a young coach and nobody, and it ain't like they do now. I'd have to get my own way around. And I didn't have no taxi. I guess they probably gave me some money for taxi, but I put it in my pocket. Uh, <laughs> and I was gonna walk over there, and I went over there, and I said, well, that bridge is on down there, but I can crawl under that fence. <laughs> There's a hurricane fence right there in that canal, and I can walk across that pipe, and I bet I can save myself about a 10 minute walk. <laughs> and this is right before the 1982 National Championship game in January, and it was in December, like December 31st or December 30th. I had my brand new clothes on. Going to the press conference with Tom Osborne, Dr. Tom Osborne, a very highly educated person. <laughs> <laughs> and all the press in the world was there. And I, I, there was a little hole in that hurricane fence, and, and I said, well, I'm just going to go ahead and crawl through that fence and save me a little time. And sure enough, as soon as I crawled under it, it had always one little piece of wire sticking down. It ripped my coat all the way down in the back. My brand new, I still got it, still, still got the same hole in it had. And it ripped my coat. And I went in there, and I was feeling real proud. Very, very proud of myself. <laughs> For being where we were, and then I saw, found that darn hole, and I was embarrassed as I could be. But uh, uh, that's just a funny little old story that I can remember, and I can remember being in the, the dang people never did understand me real good. Uh, we were uh, we were getting ready for the Orange Bowl, and. Uh, all these guys want to talk, and it ain't like it ain't like they're the only guy in the, in the newspaper around. But there's there's a newspaper in every town, and they but one of you, and they all want you to talk to them personally. And we were getting fitted for a tuxedo for a dance, the Orange Bowl dance, which I didn't give a shit. I'm giving. <laughs> I didn't care if I wanted to go or not. <laughs> Excuse me, I thought I was on the farm. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't have time to change clothes because we, we was practicing twice a day trying to win the ball game. And I had my coaching shirts on, uh, shorts on, my white shoes, uh, socks and a pair of shoes, and, and I took my top off, and I was getting dressed, fitted for my thing. And I was trying to tell this sports guy, I said, you can talk to me, but I've got to get my fitted. <laughs> so then he talked about after that, uh, instead of talking about what great preparation and how much time I didn't spend away from practice field and my inner thoughts were on Nebraska, the next day in a national magazine, he talked about how I dressed. <laughs> so that's where sometime I think people probably misunderstood me on, on, on things like that. We did win some big games and a lot of them was because of Rodney Williams. Uh, he was, I will give the man credit for credit's due. He won a lot of football games as a starting quarterback. And we overcame the hell out of him a lot, too. <laughs> Five-minute play action was always spent in practice on throwing the ball, because that's all I could stand watching him throw the ball. <laughs> And he did talk. He did talk to the ball quite well. He would tell him to get up and get out and all that. He, he he did. He would he would do that. But he was a hell of a competitor. He knew how to win. And uh, I'm very pleased and happy uh, that he had success. He had a lot of pressure on him to succeed. Uh, he did very well, and I'm, I'm real happy for him and happy for what he did for for our football team. Now, he told you the story about Virginia, and he's right. Uh, see, the only problem, I was 
planning on doing, and I had it planned out pretty well. But I figured if we run two more times, we'd score, and then we wouldn't have to kick off. But he went ahead and threw the ball and scored with us, and we had to kick off. So that was the only, that was only only difference. No, what he, he I can remember I can remember seeing him, and I can remember uh, the receiver out there waving, and I can remember our left tackle nearly running down the field because it was a run, and he was throwing the ball. And I can remember them geniuses at Virginia for getting the cover of that guy. <laughs> I can remember that defensive back saying after the game he thought it was a tight end over there. And he didn't see that wide receiver. Which that happens. That's, 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 that's tough luck for them. But but uh, I can also remember us playing North Carolina State. He didn't tell this story. <laughs> uh, and we had the first drive on ever the two times they beat us, once up there, once down there. The first time we took the football, we took the football right down the field just like we're supposed to, and go put the ball in the zone. Well, we was playing up there, and they did the same thing. As smart as them people are up there at North Carolina State. They forgot to put somebody on our, on our, uh, Ray Williams, our wide receiver from Fayetteville. I think we probably had a sweeper option call, one of the two. Had to be. Good trap. Good trap. Well, maybe a trap. Oh, we had a trap. Kind of so that, well, uh, Roddy looks up, and he sees it, so he's going to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to create a great play and I'm going to pick it up and throw it. But he forgot that the fullback was when it was going to trap right off his tail. So he picked up, and the fullback didn't know it. I guess it was Tracy Lancaster. Lancaster. <laughs> and it, by the time he was throwing it, he hit it right in the back. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if they call it a fumble or incomplete, but, but uh, that probably cost us the ball game in that particular sense. <laughs> Well, if he ran the play, we probably walked in. <laughs> no, but I did stay on him very hard, and the reason I stayed on him very hard because he he uh, he needed it very much. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a very fine fine player for us, and like I say, he won more football games than anybody at, at Virginia. I mean, at uh, <laughs> especially against Virginia. Coach Howard, I can tell you many stories about Coach Howard. Coach Howard, my dear friend. Always will, always has been, always will be. Uh, I used to kid him a lot about a lot of different things, but uh, the first time I ever met Coach Howard, I was a, an assistant coach at Alabama in 1960, 1970. Uh, it's 20, how long ago was that, Coach? <laughs> no, hell no, it wasn't. It was 19, uh, yeah, it was. It was, it was, it was 70. Your no. mind getting bad as mine. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to tell you the real reason I resigned, too. It wasn't because of dorm, it wasn't because of pressure, it wasn't because of nothing, it wasn't because of nothing. It was just because I was afraid I was going to grow up and look like you. <laughs> Clemson not took all the hair I got already, and I didn't want to give them no more. <laughs> no, but uh, anyway, it was in Columbus, Georgia, and it had to be 1970s when it was. And uh, he was there speaking. And I, I was there representing the University of Alabama uh, at a quarterback club. And, and Coach Howard got up there, and this is many, many years ago. And he had a stack of cards that thick. And uh, we were sitting up there, and I had the honor of sitting next to him. And Coach Bryant told me, he said, go by the, his hotel room and make sure that you send his, his best wishes from him. So I did, and he came by there, and he, he let me sit next to him. And, I never will forget it as long as I live. This was 1970. He said, he said, uh, watch this, boy. And I said, okay. So he got up, he pulled them card up, and he started reading them. And they were the same jokes that he read today. <laughs> I'm so happy. And he told me. He said, and he sat down and everybody laughed. It was the funniest figure they ever heard. And he said, always remember, when you hear a good joke, write it down on a three by five index card, put it in your desk and file, and you'll never forget it. And, and, and he was right. And then he sat down and he said, that ain't a bad way to make $500, is it? <laughs> so that's the way And the thing that I always wanted to do, and I never did get to do it, and, and uh, I always want to get a coach hired in the car and ride one day. 
and uh, go recruiting or something and, and just put them on a, a tape where I could remember these stories that he tell. But uh, you want to get paid for telling them, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> but he looked like he's gonna live longer than any of us, so I don't know if, if I really want to care for riding with me anymore or not. But he is the greatest thing ever happened to Clemson, and he is he's what Clemson's all about, and he, he created a great situation there. So uh, Coach Howard has done great. All his players respect him like Buddy and, and Gil and and uh, Wayne and everybody that stood up, they all respect Coach Howard a lot. We do too. We thank him for all he's done for us. <laughs> Made it very easy to work at Clemson, but it, it, it was nothing like it, before he he got there when it was all military and it's hard to recruit and, and uh, no girls and no facilities and all this kind of thing. So he, he, he is what, what, what made Clemson and the people that play for him made Clemson very possible. Now, I don't know what time you want to go home, but I'm sure that you would like to end it uh, for too long. But I could go and tell you a lot of lot of situations. But I do. I, I'll say this, and I'll let me get into uh, uh, whatever you want to hear. I don't know really what you want to hear because I, I like I was going to a wedding party tonight. When I left, I do think my uh, all the, not my uh, my ex secretaries are here. Uh, Susan, Sandy, uh, Elaine, and uh, Pat. Uh, for all the work they've done. Uh, Shirley Herring's here, who is uh, Les Herring's wife. Uh, Shirley, let the people meet you, because you're, you're at Clemson now, and they will know it. This is Les Herring, defensive line coach at Clemson. At Clemson now, so she's, she's still there, and all the girls are still there. So it's going to be a good place to be at Clemson, I think. Uh, I think they have an opportunity to be a good football team. They got some good people there, the, the things that make uh, Clemson are the people, and you people are very special, I can name each one of you, God built my house, God I always saw in Columbia, <laughs> Gee, Don Wade would go crazy on Thursday on tickets, and them kids would change their mind, I got friends back there from the lower part of the state, Hilton Head, Ridgeland, where I'd always stay in, in, in in two weeks in Hilton Head in the summer, and I'd always talk to him, and I'm gonna go deer hunting with him before long, and, and all the way up, you know, Glenn, they do the phones, and, and the bankers, and the people that I know. Uh, I was going, I was trying to think of something to say, and I, I think I'll know who'll be at my funeral. And that's good. <laughs> because I think I'll see my friends at my funeral, I think I, I consider you friends uh, very much. But uh, when we came to Clemson, what, what, and it came with Coach Pell. We had great people already there. What made our, what I made our job very easily was a coach, and, and I don't think they ever got the credit that they deserved, but Coach Parker had done a great job of recruiting there. When I, when I came and I was a buddy and I were offensive line coaches there, and Bill Andre was, was one of my offensive line coaches too, and Bill knows how I think, is that <clears throat> we had people like Joe Bostic, Jeff Bostic, uh, Lacey Bromley, Jimmy Weeks, all these players that were good players, better than we've ever seen, and they were quality, quality football players. So it was very easy to, to win. All that in Clemson didn't know, they just didn't know how to win. And they didn't know how to act when they didn't win. An example was we went to our first bowl game and played Pittsburgh. But we didn't know how to act as a football team or coaches. We didn't know how to prepare, and we didn't know how to act as fans. We know what was important about a, a bowl game or how to go to a bowl game because we hadn't been. We didn't know how to, how to play in a bowl game. We didn't know how to prepare for a bowl game. We didn't know how to win a bowl game. And it was just to go down there for the trip. But I think over the years we, we have learned how to, how to prepare for a bowl game. I think we have learned how to win. Uh, and I, I like the governor, I like what he said because I, I took it as a personal challenge. You know? of South Carolina. So that was good that we were able to uh, accomplish that. But little old Clemson became pretty good. So where was that Coach Howard? <laughs> but anyway, that's the best thing we did. I think that all our coaches and all our players uh, 
make Clemson something because of Coach Howard. Make something very special. Great coaches. Great players. Let's go. Shut up, Coach. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about you. <laughs> If I got, I ain't got no timeouts out there. You got, well, I, I'll be honest. Ain't no one to help me like that. I get straight down there. But then we did, we did. What I love to do is, is say, for our little old school, you know, Roddy's heard this. For our little old school up here. Like I said, big old boys. And uh, I'll change make a name for yourself. So they did. And we're real proud of them for what they did. Very much. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, we wish, uh, what would it be? Where you at? Yeah, would it be? They had, they had the freshman uh, barbecue the other day. And we said, uh, I was kidding a little bit. I said, uh, well, you got to support Clemson, you know. And uh, he was saying, one of them said, well, all your friends were there. I said, no, they're Clemson people. That's what you are. You're, you're, you got to be great Clemson people. So we appreciate you. We love you to death, and we hope you do well. And I hope we can. Uh, let me tell you. But our plans, our plans are real simple. I think my, my kids. Uh, uh, we're very happy. We're knowing our young people, our, our, our children. Uh, we're very delighted to have a year off. Getting rested. Like hell. <laughs> Staying around the house like crazy. I got in at 4 o'clock the other night. <laughs> uh, but I was at a wedding party <laughs> and all this kind of thing. But but our plans are real simple. It, it is that we want to do uh, our best thing we want to do is get our people back together. Who was our people, our coaches. And uh, we hope that we get that opportunity. We hope that we can uh, we can coach somewhere again. I think sometimes I have days where I say, yeah, we do, and yeah, we don't. But I think I think we do, and I think that we we'd like to get all our guys back together and, and build something that somebody would be proud of somewhere else. And uh, we're gonna do that if we get an opportunity. We'll we'll be a, a good football team somewhere until uh, we were taught how to win. And, Going back to our philosophy, it's real simple is that you take care of your own and you treat your people first class and anything that you do. And that's something that uh, I hope you do at Clemson. I hope the teacher uh, keep your, teaching your players first class, put them in a first class situation, uh, and make sure that they're treated win winners. I hope they win very much. I hope they win. If they lose to Virginia, oh, God bless them. <laughs> but I hope they don't. I hope they, I hope they went 11 because I really, as much as I love Rodney Wiz, I love uh, Brewster and all them boys too. So I hope they, I hope they win, and I hope, I hope, uh, I hope I'm able to come see them. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to come see them this year, but I hope so. Uh, but I, I'm very glad that you people came here tonight. I, love you to death. Uh, you're very special to our family and our people. That's one of one thing that I ask. I, I think that I want to get back into coaching. I say, God, I have to move. And I don't want to do that. Looking like I got some great friends. But then I say, I get all my people back together. And I got great friends there. So, uh, which way we go, I don't know. Maybe the good Lord's got to bless us again. They've been awful, uh, blessed us very much so far, and, and we've always been lucky. Let me have it, Coach Howard. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have what it is. <laughs> and I was up there, and somebody handed it to him. I look. <laughs> that was before the game. But anyway, wherever I was, we, we appreciate all your your friendship. You've been very nice. My family's been blessed. We love Clemson. We love the people. We, we like everything that we like about it. We hope that uh, 
I see all my friends from Thompson didn't come here today, but uh, uh, a lot of them did, and I, I appreciate that very much. But I'll tell you, I told you, like I told the high school coaches in one day, uh, life's real short, and you don't get to go to do a lot of things when you're thinking about it because you keep planning for next year, next year, next year. Next year may not ever come. So if we do ever get into in coaching again, you can bet your sweet ass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wait a minute, let me finish this story. Yeah. I moved to Clemson in 1982. Mm -hmm. I met Coach Ford in 1982. One of my bankers. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's the greatest human being that ever walked place third. What moved you to say that? <laughs> I'm done with, I mean, my deal at Clemson's over, and, and I appreciate Clemson. Oh, income. <laughs> I'm on a fixed income. Man. That's right. So, so I, you know, my, I got, I got, just like I was telling, if we do get back in coach again, we won't run it up the middle so much. <laughs> so it don't do no good to be nice. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thank you very much. I know, I wish I could introduce every one of you. I do know every one of you. But uh, we don't have that much time. Don Wade, thank you for everything you did re recruiting for us and all you people out there, people who've been out the farm working for I did tell somebody, I, I told the high school coaches this, our telephone number's in the book now. It wasn't when I was coaching. <laughs> because I know I had some irate fans after the ball game. But, but we don't have that anymore. So please call us. We'd love to see you. Come by there. We hope we're there for a long time. Uh, uh, we can we can handle where we at as a family. If we don't have if we don't have to get it's okay, because we can live right where we are and be very very happy. Uh, so if we get an opportunity to, to go somewhere, the only thing I don't want to do is ever have to play. You. <laughs> if we do, but if we do, we're gonna get out of your ass. <laughs> Uh, Ed Randall especially, uh, yeah, yeah, he was the can-do man. Uh, he, uh, he, he put a lot of this together tonight. We're very grateful well, for him, all of them. Uh, Greenwood Clemson Club uh, helped a great deal. Tom yeah. Farthing, Ben Evans, Randy Bell. Uh, Russ Madre, we thank you for the banner tonight. Uh, Bobby Robinson gave us a big help tonight, so we appreciate uh, Bobby helping. Uh, Ed, let me turn this over to you now. <laughs> We are here to honor the Ford era tonight. It's an era of which you have made us feel an important part, an era we will always remember. We as friends would like to show our appreciation for this gift. Here. And with this, we'd like to say thanks for the memories. What is that? Is that Rolex one? <laughs> I got a hundred dollars. I buy it from. <laughs> Gee, well, I, it's fake. <laughs> well, that's nice. I, I'd always want a nice watch. Uh, I told somebody when I was on my resignation uh, press conference deal that I've got to get back in coaching. Uh, because his old bow watches run out in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> this, this does not seal my whole deal. I might not ever have to coach again. <laughs> the watch has an inscription on the back, 
And before oh. Coach Howard talked, I was going to ask Danny to read it, but after Coach Howard talked, I'm not sure he can read it. And even if he could, he couldn't see it. The inscription reads, well, very much, Coach though. Danny Ford, the Ford Arrow, 1979-1989. Thank you very much. Uh, I always wanted one of these things. <laughs> I wasn't going to buy one. <laughs> you got one, Cole? Oh, I got some pigs, though. Uh, that concludes tonight. Deborah, I want to thank you for all your help over these past many weeks uh, for helping keep this a surprise. Was it a surprise tonight? No, you were just faking. No, it time. was a surprise. <laughs> okay. Until I saw that black woman in that car. <laughs> but uh, we'll, certainly, we'll certainly remember you forever, and we hope you do. Oh, I know. I know we'll forget Clemson. Nor, nor their people. Nor a couple of them guys up there. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you very much.